Hello, welcome to the Lucky Boy Records podcast. We're back again, this time with Tom Hooper from Kraken. Hello. Say hello again. I don't know why you hello. say hello a second time. Mean? He's here, and we're going to talk a lot about music, um, about recording, about playing live, about yeah. helping out with your friends and playing music and having a good time. Yeah. Um, introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, um, I'm Tom, otherwise known as Hooper, yes. sometimes, due to the confusion of having two Toms in a band, and also y- you know an abundance of Toms, uh-huh. so that's confusing. Um, I played bass in Kraken, I guess I still do, technically, that's it. But that's, yeah. it's more than just it though, because you've transformed people's lives with amazing music. I don't think I have. <laughs> Does it not feel like you have? Uh, I don't think I have. Maybe the the rest of you guys have. I don't know. It's, it's all part of a machine. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. But you did have some kind of, like, songwriting input into, like, the crack and stuff. Um, in a way, because oh, I'm not a songwriter at all. Yeah. I've never claimed to be. Um, I, I don't know why. It's just something I can't do. Mm-hmm. I've tried. Um, like there was that time I remember I was walking to uni and I was thinking about Led Zeppelin uh, and I was like god they write such good songs <laughs> yeah. or they steal such good songs I guess oh, no. but I was like the, the lyrics are amazing like and I was thinking about like Ramble On which is all about like Lord of the Rings and stuff <laughs> and like and I was just like oh man I I could tr- I should do that Mm-hmm. And in my head, I just conjured the words. It's like they just appeared before my eyes. There is a girl who likes milk. <laughs> and that's that's and then I, single. I, I, yeah, I immediately, immediately reflected on those lyrics and thought, God, I can't be a songwriter <laughs> if, that's, if that's what I come up with. But I guess, yeah, I've written, I mean, written loosely. When, when, but when we wrote songs, it was quite collaborative, I guess. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, because... I know that there, there's been times where we've tried to place who's wrote certain riffs and we literally can't figure it out. Um, yeah, like, the, I mean, there are some, like, for example, Joe, I remember yeah. being sat in front of him when he wrote Nomad, basically. Yeah. Especially the last bit, because we were just talking, and then he just immediately went, and then he's like, oh, I just thought of that in my head, and then it came out on my guitar. Yeah. And we're like, all right, well, it's a song now. I mean, there's, I think I... Like, I contributed... Yeah, I prefer that term, because I didn't write anything. Like, mm-hmm. So, I guess the chords in Sunday Best, in the, yeah. in the verse and chorus, mm-hmm. uh, that might be it. Uh, <laughs> I don't well, know. I don't know. I mean, because I, I, it was all a bit of a blur for me as well, because I think a lot of the songs were either put together by Fred or I, like in our rooms and then we brought it especially to the, towards yeah. the latter end of yeah us being a especially band. when we were trying to write a ton of songs for the album just being like we need more songs we need to get things yeah. on um yeah so that's how snake charmer came about and freddie did diatribe all on his own um yeah but snake charmer was a lot a lot of it was from you wasn't it most of it really i had With i the, had the instrumentation and yeah, I had like the two main riffs for Snake Charmer um, written and on my phone since 2014. Oh wow! <laughs> um, and I just didn't, I didn't know, know that. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with them. So when we brought them to the band and jammed it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I think that's uh, like one of our top five best songs. It's very cool. Um, Defo. Yeah, jumping back though, because obviously, well, you've graduated now. Um, uh, which yeah. is sad times. I was speaking to JJ um, when we recorded his podcast, which I think is up now. And we yes, were, I listened to it. Yeah, it was it was nice talking about graduating and just like um, what he's been up to. Um, but your experience graduating has obviously been quite different because, of course, you haven't been able to stick around York. And yeah, you, well, you've you've been doing life I, things. JJ, luckily, I think that kind of comes down to the, his degree. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I could just be talking out my ass. He found work quite quickly, I think. Yeah. Um, but I did. Like I graduated, and I feel like this is the case with a lot of people at uni. I yeah. mean, I graduated with a theatre degree, and I was like, "Shit, what, the f- what do I do now?" Mm-hmm. And it took me bloody ages to find a job. But now I've got one. 
Yeah, you're you're a TA um, now, so right. Um, well, yeah, so I'm like a support assist, learning support assistant at a college, mm-hmm. which is fun. Uh, it's not the hardest job in the world. A lot of it is just telling teenagers to get off the phone. Yeah, but you enjoy but, it, and but, you're you're getting the yeah, it's, it's fun. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You get the the cheddar cheese, mm-hmm. raking in the Benjamins. Um, <laughs> but, well, not really. It's terrible pay, but it's fine for for the minute. Like, I'm, you know, I'm still living at home, so I don't have to you know do a lot because <laughs> yeah. i'm lazy um so it's fine it's all fine but do you do you, do you still have time to do music any other like point or i mean i still practice i say practice very loosely like i play every day yeah um when i can be that bass or just on my acoustic or whatever mm-hmm. um like I, I haven't rushed to get like another band together yeah. um just because for, I guess for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm busy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm still kind of settling back into being at home um, just because it's been a bit all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and also this, the music scene around here in Warrington, which is where I live, yeah. is uh, not one in which there isn't I... One. Well, the, no, there is one actually. Yeah. It's actually pretty good, but it's not one that I... It's not the, it's not the type of music that I would that I really... Yeah, is it is it like quite folky or? No, it's just it's a lot of indie bands, a lot of sort of, and they're all really good. That's the thing; they're all, mm-hmm. they're all really good at what they do. That's just not my scene. That's yeah. just not what I'm into. Um, uh, and I feel like I just don't think I'd be able to fit in in any of those bands. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's definitely like a heavier scene, but the, the, I feel like the issue with heavy rock is that it, if there's a scene, it's like proper heavy death scream yeah eat your babies sort of thought, and that's not really yeah i also yeah. feel like quite a bit like with scenes like that it can feel quite cliquey sometimes and it's quite hard it's to kind extremely of like, cliquey. Yeah, yeah it's quite hard to kind of breach the kind of friendship groups and like band scene of metal bands yeah definitely yeah. and also there's the thing like all the people i knew at school who did music they're all in bands now or they've quit music yeah so it's kind of hard to sort of be like hey can i be in your band even though you've got a bass player or whatever yeah um but I'm in a, I'm in a lucky position that I live in between Manchester and Liverpool mm-hmm. um, because both have big good music scenes. Um, yeah, because I've been to Liverpool. especially Manchester. Yeah, but, well, yeah. I, I've been to Manchester a couple of times, but when I went to Liverpool, it was it was I didn't see any gigs. So it was quite eye opening to see like the amount of music stuff they have everywhere, like with yeah. the, with the museums yeah. and like Cavern Club and of course all the Beatles stuff. Um, it's quite funny seeing all the weird yeah, kind of memorabilia. Stuff, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, music. Yeah, I think music is a big part of Liverpool, and I do. I do feel quite. I feel closer to Liverpool than Manchester because my parents and my whole family are all from Liverpool. Yeah. Um, so we go there very fairly frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, the cavern's really cool. They like they have music on all the time. Yeah. There's loads of. Uh, but to be honest, it's the same with Manchester. It's just buskers absolutely everywhere. Mm-hmm. And there's open mic nights just all the time in both cities. Yeah. Um, my issue with Manchester is that everyone loves the Smiths, <laughs> and I absolutely hate the Smiths. Um, so it's kind of hard to, yeah. And like they're all, they all love Oasis, and I don't mind Oasis, but you know, listen to something else. Come on, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> it's more the Smiths. The, the Smiths. Yeah, he's just a he's just an enigma. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I I don't mind the Smiths as a group. I think Johnny Marr is very overrated mm-hmm. as a guitarist. He's all right. Um, he's no Joe Buttery. Ooh. Oh, or Tom Gulliver. Ooh. Um, Hot <laughs> takes. Uh, <laughs> and I think Morrissey should just stop. Just, yeah, just stop talking. Stop singing. You can't sing. Mm-hmm. Uh, his lyrics are stupid. Sorry, I'm going <laughs> to get I'm getting into a big Morrissey run. I think, I think you're going to get James Hinchliffe on your, on your arse in a bit. Yeah, I was listening to his and he was saying... I feel bad because he was obviously Morrissey means a great deal to him, and I yeah. don't want to. I don't want that to. I don't want me to to sound like I think that that doesn't mean anything to him. Mm-hmm. I just don't like Morrissey. No, he's he, he's very Marmite though. But you either hate him or love him. I mean, I don't really, um, I don't really care that much for the Smiths or like Morrissey. Oh well, you have to sit in the bloody fence. Don't you? Well, it's not that. I literally just don't listen to them out of choice, so I can't have like, yeah. an opinion on them. It's hard though when you live around here because I don't want to listen to them by choice. But when everyone loves them, yeah, 
And then oh. you just sound the radio and it's like, this charming man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am sad. <laughs> he was. Yeah, we could get it, Morris. The big emo of the 80s. He was. Bless him. Bless him um, for being sad. Now he's vegan and making everyone else sad. Yeah, but he, I mean, he came out with some bloody controversial statements. Yeah. Um, but I mean, he always does. Mm-hmm. And I feel like people are like, oh, he says what we're all thinking. Yeah. Mm, you, if you're all thinking that, maybe reevaluate your morality system. I'm not going to get into it because it's. Well, yeah. Do you find yeah. like it's quite hard to separate the art from the artist sometimes? Especially, well, Morrissey is a yeah. good example of it. Yeah, it, I, I find it hard because I know some people find it very easy, and that's no disrespect to them. Yeah. Because. Um, I mean, no, no artist is perfect, and I can't even begin to imagine what life is like to be thrust into that spotlight. Yeah. Um, and and to have to be as responsible as possible. And also the media are evil, not to sound too <laughs> anarchist or whatever, but yeah. they, they do twist a lot of things. But then mm. again, I remember talking to someone about Michael Jackson, and to me, I just can't get behind Michael Jackson because of all the allegations and stuff. I just can't. Yeah. And someone was saying, like, um, I'll be after to admit his songs are amazing. And I was like, I don't have to admit anything. Yeah. Um, which is probably a bit stubborn of me. Cause well, you can't, because the, the music isn't the artist. It isn't. Um, but, like, the thing is with Michael Jackson, like, he didn't, he probably didn't write half his songs. He's, he can write songs. Yeah, he's, suppose, he's, yeah. He's had, like, the credits for it. But, like, a lot of his really good songs or, hit, like, his big hits were, like, co written with other people. So he doesn't yeah, even get all the credit. Yeah. I mean, even so, like, if I listen to a Michael Jackson song, I it would probably just be in the background. I would never choose to listen to him anyway. Yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever put him on. I, th- I think, like, we've all watched Thriller, the yeah. music video. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably the extent of my relationship with Michael Jackson's music. Relationship with Michael Jackson. <laughs> I didn't have one. I've never... <laughs> um, but, like, you can Objectively, he's a good performer. Yeah. Well, he was. He's dead now. Uh, and he was a good singer. <laughs> Um, a good dancer, whatever you know, he was he was all that, but he was a paedophile. So, wow, yeah, well, well, apparently, anyway, allegedly, um, yeah, with a lot of evidence, but <laughs> well, you know, like I think with someone like Michael Jackson, um, I think there's a lot of privilege around like his past and how people alive today will still like try and defend him and like shrug off things yeah, and like shut people up definitely. about it. Which is again media, media being mm, evil yeah. and very, very twisted. Yeah, but at the same time, I I do like people who aren't who haven't been completely innocent. To well, not not to the extent of Michael Jackson, obviously, but just like if you look into like so the Beatles, for example, yeah. I love the Beatles. Um, they're one of my favorite bands ever. That's not like a hot take or anything, but like no. they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm sure you'll find someone else. I mean, cause I think, I've, well, I feel like the Beatles themselves get like a lot of like hate for being the Beatles because people are just yeah. like, oh, their music is uninspired and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Pe- people who don't like the Beatles, I feel this is directed at you, Freddie Island, haven't <laughs> listened to their, a lot of their songs. They hear like, let it be, hey Jude, and think, oh, well, that's the Beatles. No, it's not. Listen, li- I mean, it's cliche. Listen to Sgt. Pepper's, the mm-hmm. whole album. It's amazing. It's just absolutely fantastic. And I'm sad, this is me saying this as a big Beatles fan with parents from Liverpool, but it is amazing. Yeah. It, it, um, but, um, but back to the artist thing. Yeah. If yeah, you yeah. look at, for example, John Lennon, people, um, people, people idolise John Lennon more than any of the other. Of the four Beatles, especially mm. uh, three Beatles, I guess. Um, but if you look at the things he's done, you know, he's been accused of beating his wife and oh neglecting his son. And people, but people kind of forget that when it's John Lennon because of the whole peace thing. And you well, know, I, when he, see, I didn't even hear yeah. about any of that, so I didn't actually know. Yeah, exactly. Some things are pushed under rugs for some artists, and some things aren't. I don't know why. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Um, if you do actually like research into the Beatles, they all cheat on their wives, and they're, they're all they all did some pretty rubbish stuff. And um, Paul McCartney's still around kicking today, playing with like 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 Foo Fighters and stuff. Yeah, it's really weird. That's crazy. Yeah, he's like a hundred million years. Old. I love Paul McCartney. <laughs> Paul's my favorite Beatle. Sometimes it's George, yeah. but it's usually Paul. No, Paul is definitely the most wholesome of the Beatles. Um, he is one hundred percent. I don't think he's the greatest musician, but I feel like. He's got mm, he's got the yeah. the biggest heart of the Beatles. 
I don't know if you look at some of his some of his tracks, though, some some of them are just really good. Like, yeah. um, have you heard "She's Leaving Home" by the Beatles? Is that on Sergeant Pepper or is that on? Abbey it Road? is on Sergeant Pepper. Yeah, is, is that is Sergeant. Sergeant Pepper? Uh, That's one of the greatest songs I've ever heard in my how, life. And like, you, can you can you sing it a bit so I can kind of remember? <laughs> um, Five o'clock. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, that's and the one. like Eleanor Rigby. That's insane. Well, that, that's that, like. A, I think they're written amazingly. That's the thing. Don't, yeah, it, it takes a lot to write a song like that. Absolutely, yeah. And the, the fact that Eleanor Rigby, that was Beatles number one. That was at number one in the charts, and it all it had was a man singing and strings. A full, uh, a, yeah, four strings. Yeah, that's insane. Mm-hmm. That that was a pop song, really. If you think about it, I mean, it's different now. You have all kinds of stuff in the charts, but I feel yeah. like at the time, that's kind of bonkers as that was. Well, definitely a hit. I feel like yeah. I mean, because because nowadays, like you will get like a few songs from like I don't know, like Ariana Grande or like uh, John Legend, where it's like just a piano and singing or like just strings and singing. That's Adele's career, isn't it? Sorry, I think I think Adele is very overrated, and I think Louis Capaldi is just worse than Adele, but basically the same game. Sorry, but that's yes, fine. But adding humour as well. Uh, that's just what yeah. he bases like his career Pant from. A person. He's a real, he's he is a funny guy. I get the picture. He shouts at a piano. That's his. Sorry, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do that. So I shouldn't really criticize. Well, but that's think, just my opinion. I think you're still allowed to criticize people, even if you can't do what they're doing. Yeah, I suppose. It's like saying to someone who's worked like 50 years on producing music and then they release something like Death Magnetic, uh, Metallica's <laughs> album, and you're just like, what are you doing? Because they should know better, you know? Yeah, that's true, yeah. I d- like the most recent Foo Fighters album, I was not a fan of the production that. It was Concrete and Gold. Oh, yeah, that um, one, yeah. And Dave Grohl was doing all these interviews like, we've got the best producer in the world. He's produced Adele, he's done all these people, and the production was absolutely Ah, oh, it's mm-hmm. rubbish. Sound like it was done in someone's living room. Oh just, I just didn't like it. But yeah. also, I can't do that. Yeah, um, but I still feel like you're allowed to criticise it, though. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, as as a as a consumer of their products, I'm allowed to criticise it. Well, yeah. I mean, because like, for example, like the recent Queens of the Stone Age album, they got Mark Ronson producing that, and that yeah, was, they did. That was a really bold choice because like he just does more poppy stuff. Comparing productions of well, is it, I think uh, Concrete and Gold was probably produced similarly to the Queens of the Stone Age album because they, they do got, sound similar. Yeah, I well, I, they might have. I don't know if, even if they had the same producer. What do you know who produced uh, Concrete and Gold? Um, it was oh man. He said I watched all the interviews and he said his name. Have you heard of a band called The Bird and the Bee? Um, no, because he's the guy from that. Greg Greg Kirsten. Greg Kirsten, that's it. Yeah, I have no um, idea who that is. <laughs> But he's he's a big producer apparently for like mainstream music in LA or whatever. Adele, and him and Dave Grohl, yeah, what? Adele, Beck, Mom- Kelly Clarkson, Lily Allen, Pink, Sia. Yeah, so like big people. Beck, that's cool. I don't know. Yeah, that. Beck's cool. I like Beck. Beck's they did. Nice. They did the Scott Pilgrim soundtrack. Yeah, Beck did, and also recently Beck and Saint Vincent played. Yeah, with Foo Fighters. Yeah, I was literally watching that today. Nirvana was a big inspiration for me to hate everything. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of it. it. I feel like all teenagers have their Nirvana fades, mm-hmm. and they they find Nirvana and they're like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" And yeah. then they're like, "I hate everything. I think everything's yeah, terrible." Despite what, uh, like when they were born, I feel like you'll definitely have kids who will always be into that. Well, there'll be some kind of band which they praise like that. Um, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, well, it, you know, we all have our like, sort of grungy emo yeah. phase, definitely. I mean, for a lot of people, it was like My Chemical Romance. Yeah, I never got into My Chemical Romance and that sort of pop punk. I actually don't really like pop punk. Oh, I, I really I feel don't like, like I'm just shitting on loads of music. Well, you're allowed. You're allowed to. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's carry on talking about music I like. The yeah. thing is, well, the thing is, I was really into My Chemical Romance, but I really didn't like pop punk solely because of bands like um, early Green Day stuff and Blink One Eight Two and like Sum Forty One bands yeah. with like one name and numbers afterwards and i'm just <laughs> yeah. like what is going on forever 21 it's just like the really the most easy songs to kind of like hear and you're just hearing it being like every song sounds like this um and they have the same voices as well yeah and it's just that whiny american just yeah, yeah just not my that's not Do my thing you have I'm the a f- time yeah, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, yeah, even Green Day because I really like Green Day. 
Well, I don't yeah. really like them, but I do like them. Um, they're the best of a bad like, bunch. Yeah, yeah, they're my favourite of that of that lot. But mm-hmm. I wouldn't associate them. Well, that's the thing. I feel like they're more in the punky side, pop punk. Yeah. Whereas the rest are more definitely on the pop side. Because mm-hmm. there are some Green Day songs that are actually about stuff other than I hate my neighbourhood and my mum didn't let me go to <laughs> go roller skating or whatever the songs are about. <laughs> Though there was a, they had an album that was released like after American Idiot called like 20, is it 20th, 21st Century Breakdown or something. And I don't know. There were like, some like really cool like songs in there. Some of them were actually like, quite heavy and not just like go as, play as fast as you can yeah. with really happy chords. <laughs> yeah. Um, like they they can. What's that, what's that song they came out with? Twenty One Guns. Yeah, that's a good song. I like that one. Yeah, I think I feel like that was kind of just made for radio though. Sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. But was. like, that, and it's, it's like yeah. a song that you'd hear on the Transformers credits. Or something. <laughs> yeah, but Beck and Saint Vincent. Back to that thing. Yes. Um, I think well, Foo Fighters have like kind of done Nirvana stuff before. They've got with Pat Smear and uh, what's the other guy, Nova Slick man, Chris Chris Nova Yeah, like. yes, that's the full name. I can never pronounce. I've never pronounced yeah, his name before. It's so. funny, but he's a bass player, so I feel like I had to recite his name over and over again. To <laughs> well, I mean, you can myself as a bass. You can you can look at videos of him on stage, and he just looks like a bass player. He's the tallest man. He's the biggest man in the world. He's so big. He's he's like six foot seven or like even like playing in a stadium you can tell he's just trying to croon his body to fit on stage yeah um, yeah he's enormous have you seen those video like there was at one time he used to do this thing on stage with nirvana where he'd throw his bass into the air and then catch it and carry on playing no <laughs> one time he threw it up and it just went directly into his face <laughs> it's really <What>? funny <laughs> yeah I mean, it's kind of, you had it coming. If you start that as a trend, surely one day it's going to go wrong. But then he just carried on playing, I think. But yeah, he played back like last week or sometime with with Beck and St. Vincent. And I think it's crazy because we've talked about Beck and St. Vincent before. I know that they're two bands which you actually really like. Um, Yeah, I love St. Vincent especially. Yeah, she's so cool. mm -hmm. Seeing them all on stage, I guess, is quite quite crazy. Yeah, Beck did, uh, no, not uh, St. Vincent. So Nirvana got together. I say that quotation marks because yeah. I don't know. I feel like they've done it a few times. They um, definitely have. And obviously, it's, it's, I don't know whether you technically call it Nirvana because for those who don't know, Kurt Cobain, the lead singer, died. Yeah. Um, don't know if you don't know that or not. Yeah, he he was murdered by his wife. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stop. Oh, um, no. But yes, but for the rock, Nirvana got put in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They got nominated in. Yeah. They went locked in. Um, and Dave Grohl and Pat Smear and Chris Novoselic did they did like a bunch of cover songs yeah. of their songs and they got guest singers on. So I think Joan Jett Beck might have done another one. Um, yeah. and St. Vincent did Lithium. Yeah, I remember um, that and, they, and that's probably why they got those two back. Um, yeah. I don't know what it was it for like an anniversary or something or um, I don't know. I'm not actually sure. Um, I feel like, well, they also got Dave Grohl's uh, daughter on stage. Um, yeah, I was watching that literally today before. Oh, um, right. Yeah, because they did she's, ha- thir- she's 13. Really? And she's like, a, she's like a backing singer for the Foo Fighters. I don't think all the time, but sometimes she does shows with them. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I'd, I'd, yeah, it's really cool that they did that recently. I really, because mm-hmm. like, I, I, I like Nirvana a lot. I haven't listened to them for ages, really. Yeah, because I, I, I haven't really done that either, but when I saw this, um, saw that this happened i got back into them for like for about 24 hours and i was like oh that's cool next uh yeah next thing yeah. i feel like i don't know me as, i don't know if you're the same when i was when i was growing up it was so intense me listening to them yeah um i just have them on non-stop um mm. people have bands which like get them into like other music and for me that was like metallica and like muse as well for a lot of people it was muse i feel yeah um yeah. no i think that really i was really a bit bad. late to muse <laughs> yeah, Muse, are, Muse are crap now but yeah I, I was a bit late to the game with Muse like I only heard um, I heard Plug In Baby this year I think for the first time really somehow well uh, consciously because I will have heard it on the radio yeah. and Kerrang I guess um, mm-hmm. but I was, only, I was like oh that's Muse I didn't really realise um, but yeah I was kind of late to the game with them um, yeah now they just make boomer music they do make music. <laughs> they make music I think is going to appeal to like a different audience to what they have. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like they try and I don't know if this is actually what they do, but I feel like they try and make every album like kind of a concept album. 
Like yeah. they did the dubstep one, which <laughs> was okay. It was I get a, like yeah. Madness was a good song. Um, but the rest of it was a bit ooh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Even like Madness felt like it was like a rip off of like every Queen song sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, it was. It was. It sounded like I want to break free. I think I can't remember. But but dubstep. <laughs> yeah, but but dubstep somehow. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Imagine if Queen used dubstep. <laughs> oh, if Freddie Mercury was still around, I think that's what he'd be doing. He'd, he'd be doing collabs with Skrillex. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Well, yeah, what's has Skrillex got a career anymore? I don't know. He probably died made, very quickly. He probably made enough money out of his song, uh, what was it, Scary Monsters and something, oh, Sprites, yeah. and, and Sprite yeah. Cranberry. <laughs> Ch- yeah, Cherry Sprite. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at um, why they had the Nirvana reunion. Back to that again. Um, oh, yeah. Oops. It's because they... It says, charity, this is a quote from The Guardian, by the way. It says, when arts charity, the art of Elysium, announced the lineup for its annual Heaven is Rock and Roll Gala in Los Angeles. See, that wasn't even English for me. Um, no, I don't want that me. They, they did it, and I'm glad they did it. <laughs> Yay, well done go. for them. Uh, do you think Nirvana, like, influenced some of your, like, bass lines and stuff in Kraken? Or? Yeah, th- they influenced my tone. Yeah. Um, the tone I go for. Because it's like... What's that song where it goes? Is that from That kind of sounds like all Nirvana songs. Yeah, it does. No, it's from um, Nevermind. Anyway, there's a re- that bass tone's really is really what I like. And like lounge act is a really to oh me, yeah yeah a re- yeah really important bass line for me because it's. I remember my uncle showed me that because I was getting into Nirvana and he really likes them. And he's like, learn lounge act on bass because it's yeah. really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I just got my Thunderbird, which is a pretty grungy looking bass, I guess. Yeah, um, definitely. And I just listened to that. I was like, oh my God, that's insane. Like that's a, someone came up with that. That's crazy. And, mm-hmm. the, and the tone is just like. Crunchy. Like, we, I've, we've joked before where I said like I wanted a tone like a pissed off alligator. <laughs> and, it, and it does sound like it just does. like a growling angry alligator that's gonna bloody have you for dinner I yeah and i think that's something which we've really tried to like keep well it's well you've tried to keep and i think when i when i produced uh when i've been producing songs for the album when we heard spit on your grave that was the the biggest yeah. that was huge yeah that's good i um, love that yeah. i think that's the first um, time that we've been able to like really make the alligator really angry Oh yeah, on record. Proper. I guess in a way it did influence me, Nirvana, or they did. Mm. Um, but like I said, I'm not a songwriter at all, really. So yeah. it wasn't so much Kurt, like Kurt Cobain's songwriting; it was just more the energy that they yeah. had. But being able um, to being able to craft like a, a tone or like a sound takes quite a bit of time to kind of get right. And I think yeah, and I didn't have it right for a long time because I had that bloody whammy pedal for a while because I thought that was really cool. Because well, I, mean, I think I was into Royal Blood at the time. And also, and, uh, also that was before I joined, and we you wanted like a you, you guys wanted like a thicker tone than trying to true, get another yeah, yeah, guy in, um, but w- which is one way of doing it. But it, yeah. I don't think it sounded. I thought I broke my whammy pedal when I used that in one of my old bands, and I got really really upset. Turns out I plugged it in the wrong way. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> I I did that at so many gigs. Do you remember that time when I was like panicking on stage? <laughs> we were getting ready to play, and I was like, "Golly, golly, my tuning pedal isn't working." And you, and you looked at me like, "What?" And I was like, no, seriously, it's not working. And I hadn't even plugged it in at all. Oh my I hadn't plugged God. anything into it. It was just on the floor. And mm. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I used to do that all the time. Really oh. stupid. We're going to have a, a, a listen to Spit on Your Grave, actually, now. Oh. Um, and we're going to chat about yeah. it. Okay. So just going back to, like, the bass tones and, like, all of that and just yeah. trying to capture the energy of the band when mm. it was together. Um, yeah. I guess we technically still are. Well, yeah. In a way. All right. So well, this is this is spit in your grave from an album which will be out sometime. Have fun listening yeah. to the song.
also, we just heard Spit on Your Grave. We didn't, because we literally have, we've skipped it, because it would, take, it would take too long to set this up from a Skype call and trying to, like, That's l- true. listen to it That's on true. both sides of the UK. Well, not both sides of the UK. You're, you're probably quite close to me, actually, right now. Well, yeah. Well, like, both sides of the UK, if you're talking west, east and west. Yeah, exactly. Well, this song is a very fun one to play live. Um, yeah, it is a lot of fun. We've only played it, like, two times live, though. Um, it was it was always one of my favorite ones to practice as well. Yeah, it's just really it's just really fun. It's, it's quite easy. Yeah, it's nothing really too complicated. It follows quite like a a simple formula. Yeah, um, yeah. But like it's got like um, it's bloody huge, and the end riff is so cool. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I remember yeah. when we were coming, when we were talking about that because Fred was talking about the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I think we we're trying to figure out what to do with the end. Yeah, I remember we were, we were in Courtyard, weren't we? Yeah, we were in Courtyard. And I haven't left the part. table. And Fred was like, so the song seems like it's quite positive. And then he says, like, positive things about a person. And then in the chorus, he says he wants to spit on their grave, which is kind of like juxtaposed. And we were talking yeah. about how to end it. And I was like, well, if, if we... And I'm quite proud of coming up with this. I was like, if, we set, if the song doesn't sound too nasty yet, why don't we take that idea and have a really filthy-sounding ending yeah. to it? And you were like, I have an idea. And then you did your computer whiz magic and came back with this absolutely evil riff. Like, it's just, yeah, you just had it. And it's just like, and you showed it to me. And I was like, that is exactly what I meant. Yeah. I didn't have any, like, notes in my head or any chords or anything. I was just like, that is perfect. That's utterly the definition of what I was saying. Mm -hmm. As soon as this ends, I'm going to listen to it again. (laughs) Yeah, me too. But I remember when it was played on um, BBC Introducing. He kept, he was talking during the ending riff. Yeah, he was. And it was really annoying because that was my favourite part of the song. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, please, please. My God. And he's like, that was Kraken while well, it was happening. I was like, oh, no. Jericho Keys when he called us Klafken. <laughs> oh, he does a lot, though. He's he's put a lot he's of a, the, the... He's le- a bloody hard worker, isn't he? Well, yeah. He does it, like, every week. Well, most of them. But um, he's and put... And he loves it. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised. It's a great job to have. He's put so many, so many of the record label songs on the radio now. Um, I think... Yeah, he's... He's done almost all of, well, not all of them, because you keep getting new artists, you can't keep up well, the but with is, a lot of the artists. I think every artist has been played on a BBC introducing station. We've got Bass and Shippers, front, yeah. well, Bass and Shippers and Mickey Blouse were played in, like, Coventry and Bedfordshire. Um, well, Charlotte Hall obviously had her interview, and that was amazing. Yeah, that was really cool that she got to go there. <laughs> Jerry, technically. Well, Jerry aren't on the uh, the label. You recorded them, though. I did record them, and that was a lot yes. of fun. That's, that's the thing with uh, with the label as well. When I finish a mix, everyone's just like, oh my God, show it to all your friends. And I'm just like, wait until it's out. Yeah, I usually I usually show a couple of people. Yeah, I'm like, show my family. When, yeah, like when you sent us the finished version of Poison, and I cried at Joe's solo because it yeah. was that good. Mm-hmm. I had to immediately show people. Like I went, I, was, I remember I was walking back from the library, and I went home. Uh, on the way, on the way home, I listened to it and cried. Yeah. I think that was an emotional time anyway because I was half, like coming towards the end of my dissertation. I think I shed a few tears just during that month. And I went home and showed it to my housemates, and I was like, "Listen to this!" And then I played it, and they were like, "Yeah, that's good." <laughs> and I was like, "No, you don't understand. <laughs> it's amazing." Yeah. It's so good. It's, I mean, some people have heard it live, but I feel like not a lot of people remember, which is fair. But yeah, I think yeah. it's a shame that Kraken aren't performing anymore because I feel like, especially with like band stuff, personally, I feel like it's one of the best experiences you can have with a group of people and the friends you can make is like absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Like I've, I've made three of my best friends through yeah. Kraken. I was so um, lucky when Freddie approached me, literally just because I was wearing a T-shirt. Um, yeah, and that's kind of how those things happen though. Yeah, and I remember Fred was really reluctant actually because I met. So let's see, when did you join? It was like early, early last year. It was October 2017. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, I thought it was later than that. In 2018, we in the February of that we had the MUN gig. Oh um, yeah, of course we did. Yeah, yeah. Forgot about that. God. Wow, that was a disaster. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, but when me and Joe put forward, I think this is probably during the summer of our first year going into second year yeah. so we'd been a band for uh, probably for a few months mm-hmm. probably about six months maybe a bit longer yeah and me and joe said look we think that we should have someone else because we, we were just a three-piece at that point mm-hmm. um and we were like uh we need more noise basically yeah um 
And me, like, I've sang before for things. Like, I did a lot of musical theatre stuff at school, and mm-hmm. I did, I sang for some college stuff, some, like, when I did music then. But I'm not a singer. No. I can't really properly, anyway. And especially not the stuff that Freddie writes, because um, I've got such a bloody low voice. Yeah. I can't. My range is terrible. Um, but it is useful. It, for some things, like mm-hmm. landmines. Yeah. Um, and Christmas dramatic readings. Yes. Uh, but we were like, and, and Joe doesn't like singing that much either. So we were like, we need a backing singer. We need, a, at the very least, a rhythm guitarist. And we were kind of struggling for producers. So and we were like, we need proper recording done if we want to actually do anything with this. And Fred was very reluctant um, to have anyone join. I think because us three gelled really well together, just as friends in general. Yeah. Um, as well as like musically we just worked well together he didn't want anything to come in and potentially change that or ruin it mm-hmm. um so we kind of looked around for some people and we i think we oh, i don't want to say auditioned we played with one guy he was really nice and he was really good it wasn't our thing yeah mm-hmm. which made fred even less reluctant or even more reluctant even to have anyone come in and then he's like oh i found this guy he's perfect and then you came in and you were perfect yeah I, I feel like i feel like um because freddie was so reluctant i feel like if anyone was going to f- have to find someone and then be right, it would be Freddie himself. Yeah. To con- to well, that's what me, I think that's what yeah. me and Joe said. Like, like you look, we want someone. You need to choose, so you do it. You find them. Yeah, and thank God I was wearing a Dinosaur Pile-Up T-shirt. Yeah, exactly. You bonded um, over that. Imagine if, imagine if you were wearing, like, a Beatles T-shirt <laughs> or, a, or a Smith's T-shirt. He would have just, came up, to me, he would just came up to me and slapped me. Yeah, would have punched you in the face and said, get out. I I will love the album when it's finished. Yeah. However, nothing will taint my love for the first EP. The thing I is, love that. that. People, well, we can even like look at it and be like, it definitely wasn't perfect. There's so many things. Oh no! But Freddie wants I... to re-record some of his bits. I know you want to record some of your bits. I want to record basically re-record basically all of my stuff. Uh, yeah, and like the but... produ- the production as well on it is like, in my opinion, not great. But oh, it's still amazing. It's, it sounds it. and it, could, yeah. considering what we, we had never had anything before, we were like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" It sounds like real me. Yeah, it was so much fun to make as well. It was. It was super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like I remember you saying this, like recording that EP. I feel like it strengthened us as a band because it the stuff we put we played became staple for what we did live. Mm-hmm. I can feel like I'd kind of just wing it with a, each bass part every time we played it live for whatever song it was yeah. I think especially Pharaoh um, but recording it and having like definitive parts that are recorded it really influenced us playing it live as well it's made it really strong definitely I feel like when you when you record a band um, you have to like really focus on each individual part and having that time in the studio to like look through every single note on every single instrument just makes yeah. your whole kind of band yeah. more tighter anyway. And I've, I've experienced that when I've recorded every, I think every single band I've, I've uh, recorded, they probably could say that as well, especially bands like the shamble and like pineapple hangover. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's such a, it's such a good time being able to go into the studio. It takes a lot of time out of your day. It does take a lot of time. Yeah. But like, it's definitely worth it. Um, and a lot, it takes a lot of uh, packs, six packs of chocolate crepes. Oh my god, so many chocolate crepes. I ate so many crepes mm-hmm. during the the last year. Just but especially when we recorded. Yeah. I don't know why. I was just like, I need crepes. I need all of them. I need all six mm-hmm. in me right now. It was good fuel to get us through it. I think it made me a bit crazy as well. Oh right. Having okay. that much having that much sugar yeah, and eating yeah. all of that. But outside of your talents of like playing music, we briefly mentioned this earlier about your uh, uh, your feature on the Christmas album. Yeah, that was a I lot of that. fun. That was a lot of fun to record as well. Even though I was just on my own, uh, I literally just did it where I'm sat now in my room. Yeah, um, yeah, I love doing stuff like that. I used to uh, like kind of voiceover stuff. I used to really want to be a voiceover artist yeah, for quite a while. I remember because because. Um, you would always like send like jokey kind of like voice messages to like the chat and stuff, but they would actually sound like really good impressions of whatever you were trying to do. That was kind of my dream for a long time, especially during college. So during school, everyone was hitting puberty at random times. Yeah. And I took a while for some reason, my body mm-hmm. to get into gear. Yeah. Uh, so everyone was, I'd get made fun of, like, just like banter. Just, it was fine. Like people saying, oh, your voice hasn't broke yet. 
Mm-hmm. And then it did break, and everyone was like, oh, oh dear. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's very low. It really broke. And I, like, I used to scare children in year 11 with my voice. Like, we had a, I, was, I used to be in all the school productions because of the drama. And I, had, I arrived early for whatever reason. And it was a whole cast production, so it's year 11 to 7, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I arrived early, but my friends hadn't arrived. Arrived, so I was kind of just stood at the back waiting for everyone to come in. And these year seven girls, like, stood in front of me, just like mindlessly, just stood in an area. <laughs> yeah. And they were doing the register. My friend hadn't arrived, and they said, um, "Matt." And I was just, oh, just looking up, I was like, "Oh, he's not here yet!" And they, all the girls screamed, because, <laughs> <'cause, laughs> yeah, because I just bellowed behind them. And people used to come up to me and be like. Do you remember that thing where it's like, maybe lock them doors and turn the lights down low? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People used to get me to do that. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm so nervous. No. <laughs> yeah, and I, I used to do, I'm at, in college, I did voiceover stuff for people's productions and things. And Yeah. Well, I yeah, think... And I, so it's, I used to really want to do it. I bought, I got myself a big microphone set up and everything. And I, I kind of did some auditions online. Oh, really? For, for some... I think there was like a, a a guy who did Lego stop motion animation, and I was like, and he used to do like Batman ones, and I was like, I, I kind of targeted like small YouTubers who couldn't really. He used to just do all the voices by themselves. Yeah. So I sent this guy a message like, "Hey, I'll do voices for you," and he's like, "Oh, send me some stuff." So I did like Batman voices of like different characters, and then he just never got back to me. <laughs> I was oh, like, no. "No." So and I did I did some for some games. Mm-hmm. Only audition, and then I and then I quit <laughs> basically after that. Did you do EPQ at college? Yes, I wrote my EPQ uh, about the history of voice acting and stuff. Oh my god, I did um, I did mine on like um, Brian Eno and like music like, that AI like generates and stuff. That's like a real essay. Mine was rubbish. <laughs> oh right, well because I didn't actually finish mine, so there you go. Oh, <laughs> I got a D on mine though. I sub- submitted my first draft without editing it at all, and got a D. So I was like, do you know what, if I put some work into that, I could have actually done something. And um, it's, something it's something which you obviously like really, really like as well, so... Yeah, and, and I'm still interested in it. Like, I, I know a lot of stuff about... I think I have a good ear for voices now because of it. Yeah. Because I was really into it for a long time. So we'll be watching an advert, and I'm like, oh, that's so-and-so. Yeah. And they're like, how do you know that? So I, I, how do you not know that? I could just tell yeah. from their voice that it's... Someone famous or someone not famous or the the guy who voiced Super Mario did one of the voices of a dragon in Skyrim. He did, he did Parthenax in Skyrim. Yeah, he's he like did. the main he's like the main dragon and he's got like the deepest like the deepest voice ever and it's just I remember when I found that out, I was like, What the f that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> How do voice actors do that? It's crazy. Yeah, he's he's lucky yeah. that he was able to kind of have that break and literally be one of the biggest like video game characters of all time. Parthenax. Yeah, and he does. He, he basically, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, su- super Parthenax bros. Yeah. Um, um, but anyway, we're but gonna yeah. we're gonna quickly hear a snippet of the Christmas uh, recording that you did. Actually, oh um, yeah, it'll it only be like fifteen seconds or whatever. But just to show you guys exactly what it was like. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. But yeah, that was that was uh, the uh, that was your Christmas recording and that was amazing. Um, yeah, some of it, yeah. Putting that together was so much fun. Yeah, I do love doing stuff like that. And I remember we had weird noises for me to do in the album as well and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like every now and again, be like, oh, we'll put a Tom noise. Some screams and stuff. Yeah, I screamed on Hey Look It's Me and I said, you're making meatloaf. I still don't understand that. I think I don't know why I said that, but I said... I don't, well, I think it was because Fred, one of the lyrics was, you're making me laugh. But, uh... but somehow it just degraded into you're making meatloaf. <laughs> you're making meatloaf. That's really funny. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I completely forgot about that. So many, so many uh, yeah, hidden, yeah, so many hidden Kraken memories which I'm unlocking from gems, doing this. Yeah. It's great. This is the thing with yeah. like with bands. It, it becomes much more than just a band. It, it's such a such an intimate friendship, and it's so good. Um, it becomes a family. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's it's so healthy, and I think 
I, I say this a lot when I'm speaking about music and writing music and playing music, but like it's definitely some of the best like musical therapy I feel yeah. like and just playing is just so healthy and so good for you and it just makes yeah, you feel so good. It, yeah, especially I feel like the kind of I don't I mean I don't know, but the kind of music we played as well is very big and very loud. Yeah. And sometimes if you are feeling stressed at uni, just go into band practice and sweating and just screaming and making huge noises is just really fun and That's really therapeutic. It's it's great. And also like but it would it would always become like a social thing as mm-hmm. well. Oh, like we'd always go to courtyard afterwards to have lunch or to get drunk or whatever. Yeah, um, and it's, it's even the same thing with the studio stuff as well. Like just being able to be locked underground. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like it say say we were doing a full day of drums. Usually, all four of us would be there just to hang out. Yeah, and to help, I guess, in some ways. But it, it was just the best time. And we all had fun on stage as well. I bloody miss playing live. That's probably what I miss the most, just like going berserk on stage. Yeah, definitely. It's just so fun. It is. What do you think is like your favourite song of all of the crack on songs that we have? Oh, man. Favourite song? Well, I've got different love for different songs. Like, yeah. so Sunday Best, for example, was for a while my favourite because I feel like I had the most to do with that one. Yeah. Even though it wasn't a lot. I, re- I just really like the sound of it. Well, um, I really like songs with like really huge endings and stuff like yeah, that. And that's why Sunday yeah. Best was my favourite from the from the EP for a really long time. Uh, Snake Charmer is just a classic. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like Snake Charmer and Nomad are kind of memes a bit yeah, in a good way. Definitely. Um, Especially with so like, uh, like my girlfriend Poppy, she, um, she's made like TikToks to <laughs> Snake Charmer. Um, sounds like a dating like a fourteen year old. She's twenty one, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and like her her sister really likes uh, both of her sisters really like Snake Charmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she told me that she played it in the car. And her dad was like, "Who's this?" And she's like, "Oh, it's Tom's band." He's like, "Oh, it's actually quite good." And I was like, "Oh, thank." Yes, he likes it. Um, Nomad, I don't know. Nomad's just, I don't know, it's something about Nomad that's just, I just love that song so much. I was thinking about it the other day. It's so simple, really. It's a really weird song. Like, it's got two verses, it hasn't got a chorus. Um, it's got two chords throughout the entire thing. Yeah. Really. Um, and the lyrics are just, just like, it's, it's just like such a, it doesn't really say anything. It's just about a guy no, who doesn't. walks. Yeah. But I think it's great. <laughs> it's bizarre. I think the fact that it doesn't have a chorus is really weird. I guess Nomad's one of our bigger songs. Yeah. Um, there isn't like a singy alongy bit, apart from... Yeah, apart from no, well, yeah. no one knows the lyrics after that. <laughs> What's your favourite song? What's your favourite song? Well, I don't, I don't really know what my favourite one is because I will like a song for playing it live, but I can also say, like, I like a certain song because of how it sounds in the studio. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, Poison Me is 100%, like, one of my most proud moments in terms of, like, yeah. studio work. Yeah. But live... Um, Sunday Best is amazing to play because I can, so I can mess around with so many effects and I get a solo as well. Yay! Um, the rhythm guitarist gets a solo. Yay! And it's a cool That's, solo as well. It's like your surfer rock yeah. solo. Yeah, I definitely. Like I don't know what else. I really, really enjoy playing uh, Snake Charmer because you can just go go crazy. Yeah, um, that's fun. Especially because yeah, yeah. Well, because us guitarists tune down to drop B as opposed to you being in drop D. Me. Um, because we just all we do is tune one string like five tones lower. Yeah, and that's fun. That's so cool. I think of Pharaoh. I always have, I love playing Pharaoh live because we used to do it and it would always wake people up because it would be quite a quiet start and then I we'd do, explode. Oh yeah, I do remember playing that in courtyard and everyone was just like they literally <laughs> jumped out of their skin. <laughs> themselves, yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> So I'm gonna. We're gonna play one more Kraken song, 
um, on the podcast. Uh, I was trying to ask you that question so we could figure out what we'd listen to. Oh, <laughs> um, but Oops. I don't really, I don't really know what. Um, which one do you want people to hear? Um, let's see. It, has, it should be one that's been released already, really, shouldn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to debut any than, new uh, stuff. Nothing hidden. Uh, let's just have Snake Charmer. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. The well, classic. Well, this then. This is Snake Charmer. Um, it certainly is. <laughs>
that was Snake Charmer. Um, yeah, that was the first single, which is well, which well, the first song that was is released from the album, which still isn't out. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> this is something which is uh, we need to we need to work on it. But it is Joe. It is Joe. Well, we can't. It's not like it's his fault. No, but it kind of is. It's just it's just unfortunate because I wish we w- we had the time to record it back when we were all in York and. Did yeah. stuff. If we started, if we're, if we're all in like the same year, in like if we, if me, if us three were in second year when you were, yeah. we probably would have done it by now. It'll come out eventually. Yeah, it will come out. But anyway, speaking of like recording music and stuff, there was a lot of talk um, towards the end of your uni years that we were going to do like a country <laughs> album. <laughs> oh yeah, I think about that sometimes. Yeah, I, I do as well because I was I was thinking about things to ask you, and I was I was thinking about the different kind of genres of music you like because obviously we've talked about what you like in terms of uh, Nirvana and the Beatles yeah. and like Tim Vincent and Beck and all the people around mm. that. Um, but you love a bit of country. Yeah, like when people ask me what kind of music I like, I'm like. Where do I start? Mm -hmm. And I completely blame my parents because both of them are very broad tastes in music, as in their genres. Yeah. So I was kind of brought up listening to a lot of Johnny Cash because my grandpa was was a big Johnny Cash fan. And especially as I got older, my voice got deeper. I was like, oh, wow, there's a musician that utilizes deep voices. Especially because, like, in in rock, you've either, like, there's a lot of screaming and a lot of high voices. And I was just like, oh, I can't really, I don't really, I can't do any of them. Yeah, um, and then here comes this amazing singer songwriter mm-hmm. with an incredibly deep voice, incredibly incredibly resonant voice. Yeah, and I was just like, oh my god, that's insane! I love it because a lot of um, a lot of like student bands, even myself, I think you've done it as well. We've we've played Folsom Prison Blues before at some of the open mics. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's great. yeah, it's a really easy song to just bash out. I think yeah, because um, people know it as well. Yeah, and that's and I mean that whole album's insane. Uh, mm-hmm. The the one where he does the live one in the prison. There's a the the best version of Cocaine Blues, is it on that on that album? You know, it's just so good. Mm-hmm. It's just it's an amazing version of that song. Everyone should listen to. It. Yeah. But yeah, I kind of want to record a country EP or something like that. Yeah. Again. Would you think it would be jokey, or do you think it'd be like a serious country EP? I don't know because like it's it would be very easy to make it jokey. I yeah. feel. Um, and I I quite like the idea of. Just having a laugh with it because I mean it's I mean it's a country EP that I, you know that I would sing. I'm yeah. not an amazing singer, so it, it would just be a laugh. But also at the same time, I'm like, oh, I could do like some cool covers of like the really sad ones. Not like not hurt. <laughs> I don't want to do a, co- a cover of hurt because that's just a bit like. Anyway, I do this. We do this every single time we do uh, one of these podcast things. Um, yeah. But I get you to list a number of things in the space of one minute. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be fun uh, because I'm going to get you to list off as many uh, bass players as you can. Fuck's sake. All musicians oh, who have really influenced you playing, starting now. Okay, uh, so Chris Novoselic, um, Paul McCartney as a bass player. Uh, I, get, I mean, everyone has to say flea because like, they, I feel like even if you don't like slap, you're first like, oh, I can do this when you see mm-hmm. flea. Um, uh, musicians in general, I guess Johnny Cash is one of them, one of the big ones. Uh, Dave Grohl, just for just his attitude. Um, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, all music has just left my brain. Um, I guess all of the Beatles. George Harrison, I love his um, mentality and stuff, to, and, and just his uh, everything about him, his, perso- his persona. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, God. Uh, I guess Kurt Cobain, in a way. Uh, oh, Tenacious D were a big influence for me because they were really funny, and I wanted to be funny when I was young. Um, mm-hmm. But also, they write amazing music. So I guess Jet Black and Tenacious D. Uh, Time. Uh, I don't know. Okay, Ooh, that was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I frightened you. I'm sorry. It's just spooky. Yeah, well, I mean, because we, because I, I grew up on some of Tenacious D's music as well. Um, well, Tenacious D got me into playing music. I can't believe I haven't said that yet. Oh my like, god, really? Remember, <laughs> yeah, like they. I remember it was the first band I got into, other than oh, Gorillas. That's one of them. Yeah, um, Tenacious. Yeah, Tenacious D. Because I, I listened to their music when I was probably I was probably like eleven or something mm-hmm. when I was first. Um, I was just like, yep. 
wow, this is insane because they write really cool songs, really good rock songs, but mm-hmm. also the lyrics are hilarious. Yeah. And the production's incredible and Jack Black's vocal's incredible and Dave yeah, Grohl's on the drums and well, stuff. Well, yeah, the thing is, like, Jack Black is a really, really good vocalist. They could just be a regular band. I know, but I feel like Jack Black is just like, you can't take him seriously as, as like, <laughs> as anything. No. I mean, like, School of Rock is some of, well, is most people's, like, one of their childhood films, especially musicians. Yeah, definitely. And how definitely. they get into it. Um, well, I discovered so many brilliant songs through that film, like Immigrant Song. Yeah. That's one of my favorite songs ever, and that was on that film. And mm-hmm. like uh, Sunshine of Your Love by Kareem, that's on there. Yeah. Um, that's, that film's amazing. I think there's a few, there's, there are a few perfect films in the world, and School of Rock is one of them. It's not, it's not like the best film ever, yeah. but just everything about it is perfect. It's really great. I feel like I when, I've, when I've been growing up, a lot of Jack Black's kind of like uh, rocky kind of media outlets like that, and uh, Brutal Legend as well, the game. Brutal Legend, what a game. I, I, haven't, that. Yeah. I haven't even thought about that game in ages. Um, that, yeah, but that, you know, like Ozzy Osbourne was in that game and stuff like that. It's literally an open world game where you have an axe, like a guitar as an instrument, um, you yeah, solo to like raise things out of the ground and you can like rip people's faces off by playing like massive solos. It was the most yeah. ridiculous thing. But the soundtrack was immense. It was incredible, yeah. Um, and speaking of soundtracks as well, Guitar Hero was something which everyone knows that I absolutely adore. Yeah, that's how you got into playing guitar, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Did you ever play yeah. it? Yeah, I was rubbish. I was really, really bad. I'm, I don't have uh, the Guitar Hero stuff anymore, but it reminds me of um, in my first year... Or it might be in second year when I programmed a Guitar Hero controller and changed it oh, yeah. to changed it into a keyboard. Um, yeah, and you but you also published like you can play Sunday Best on Guitar Hero. Can't. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I was so I was such a little yeah. nerd back in first year. My god, no, that's cool. I think that's really cool. It was cool, but I was just like so embarrassed. No, that's really cool. Yeah, I was really bad at Guitar Hero. I mean, I couldn't progress to the. I only did the first three colors. I yeah. couldn't do any further. And I had the drum kit, and I was really bad at that because I wanted to play drums for mm-hmm. a long time. But see, so did we, I, I. But I, after five years of playing it, I only got to grade two. So there you go. Yeah, I don't. I literally became a bass player because in my year at school there was a really good guitarist a really good singer and a really good good drummer yeah so i was like oh, i guess I'll, I'll play the other one because i wanted to be in a band yeah so i played bass well did you, were you in any bands like before kraken or not really i mean i had a band at school for quite a while probably since about year nine to year 11 um oh, nice. but we never had a name we never played anywhere outside of school and we only ever did covers so um mm. But I did play a lot of live music at college because I did like a music course and a lot of it, it was like a popular music course. So each term we did, so the first, the first term we did 50s music, mm-hmm. then 60s, 70s, then 80s, 90s, and then modern music. I got to play loads and loads and loads of really good songs mm-hmm. um, and get used to playing live. But yeah, and I was never in a real band. And I remember when I came to you and it's like, I want to join a heavy rock band. And, and you that's did. that's exactly what I did. I yeah. joined Kraken. That was yes. that's amazing. I didn't know that you did a, did a music course in college. Yeah, it was BTEC, but um, yeah, got me to uni. Well, um, <laughs> I guess that's quite nice and because cause you well you said earlier about how you you really get uh, you really enjoy like uh, Johnny Cash and the Beatles, and I guess that was probably amplified when you were doing your course and it was focused. Yeah, on it of helped it as well. a lot. It, it, it let me it helped me discover loads of music as well because I've got like a playlist on Spotify of like forties and fifties music. Yeah, because of that, that course and stuff and like. Because uh, I, I, I re- I'm really into. I remember I was listening to Jordan say this, and I was like, "Yes," because I'm really into '60s music as well, '60s, mm-hmm. '70s stuff, yeah. like all Vietnam. So like all the Rolling Stones and like Bob Dylan and all that stuff. And I, uh, that was through that course again. Yeah, um, it was really cool. Yeah, because I'm really into a lot of folk music as well now, and a lot of the music which I play on my own is kind of folky, just because it's like me and an acoustic guitar. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah, so and a drum machine. Well, not anymore. I used to do a bit of it, but <laughs> it's just me and a me and a guitar now. But um, it's a it's a lot of fun, kind of speaking to or well, when I was speaking to Jordan about it and having all those chats about being an authentic musician and how it was probably quite easier back yeah, in the day yeah. to be like that. But, yeah, definitely. But but yeah, I, I mean, because you played, I guess you've played a lot of covers through the through the years, and we played in that band with JJ as we mentioned in the other podcast. That was really fun doing that, yeah. That Except was, for when we did the Pretender, that wasn't fun. That was so hard. 
Yeah, it was just bad. I don't know why. And it everyone was getting, everyone uh, was getting so frustrated. Yeah, <laughs> it just didn't work at all. But I guess that was kind of just Kraken plus JJ anyway, so... Yeah, it was fun. It JJ's was an extremely good vocalist. He's amazing. He Well, his classical training, I didn't even know about that, so that's cool. Yeah, he's re- and he's really good at sax and guitar and mm-hmm. bass and... Well, I'll come back to you, York, and I'll well, see yeah. you both. But yeah, I guess you, you've played a lot of covers, but um, and you've, you've you've written stuff with Kraken. Do you think that generally, like music, has been one of the best things, like for keeping like your morale quite high during uni? So I feel like it's quite a tense time in yeah. university. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a way to escape from just uni itself because uni's hard. It's really it's taxing for like your mind obviously because you're learning a lot, but also just like your, your kind of spirit and your morale because yeah. it can just be really draining, um, re- just really hard in all aspects. Because like, especially for people, you know, living away, it can be quite like a shock when you have to start actually being an adult. <laughs> um, yeah. Ju- but just being every like sort of once a week, twice a week or whatever, go, being able to go and just play music and just hang out afterwards, it was just a really nice way of kind of just breaking that up a bit. Yeah, definitely. And also... I got to meet new people. Like I never would have met Fred and Joe and you, yeah. and probably and your housemates because I've got really good friends with them. Yeah, uh, probably wouldn't have met Poppy if it wasn't for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have met the Basement Strippers. I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have gone to Bedford to do that gig. I wouldn't yeah. have. You know, I, I wouldn't have done a lot of stuff for it. So I'm extremely grateful for it. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Like if music yeah. wasn't part of a lot of our lives, like we wouldn't. We would probably have completely different kind of social lives as we would now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of um, it's kind of crazy. I'm sure it would have probably been naturally replaced with something else. Um, yeah, oh yeah, definitely, yeah. But having um, that kind of focus around, I just play music and the kind of good times that come with it is just quite nice. Yeah, it's, it's been amazing. It has been amazing. Um, I find that it's one of the most therapeutic things you can do as we've said earlier, but one of the coolest absolutely, things yeah. one of the coolest things is like writing music and trying to figure out and having the confidence, um, I think I, I guess just the confidence generally when you're doing music for so long, and you can finally look back on it and be like, "Wow, we were really, really good." That's yeah, one of the coolest did, things like, to we, do. We did something. Luckily, now in, in the world that we live in, with Spotify and all that, those songs are on there forever now. Yeah, and they're out there forever. So you know, in like thirty years or whatever, I'll be like, "Oh, I'm going to listen to Kraken." Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know we could show our children cracking or whatever I don't know <laughs> it's you kind know, of, yeah. just stuff like that like it's, it's I mean, stuff that we have done now and it's there forever and we're all really proud of I mean because I, I was thinking about this this is very existential but um, <laughs> when um, when we eventually pass on our legacy to the next generations a lot yes. of people <laughs> thing is a lot of people like our like our great grandfathers or whatever they, we don't have a much to remember them by but because yeah. of like the technology that we have now people could easily like find music which we've made like even like if i had like great grandkids and i wasn't around they'd be like wow my great granddad made this a really heavy rock song yeah, um, <laughs> yeah like it's kind of crazy. crazy how how that will be the case um, well, yeah that's that's kind of that's what we're heading towards as long as the planet doesn't burn or world well, three kills us all or whatever well, what a yeah. horrible things happening in the world at the minute mm-hmm. if they don't happen then be all peachy anyway i think that's probably enough for uh, the podcast <laughs> that's enough that's enough we're done before we go even <laughs> deeper um but it was very very awesome having you on and chatting about all Thank things you. kraken um recording playing music music therapy all that nirvana yeah yeah thank you so much for having me on your podcast no it's awesome um one more question if you were uh, gonna give any advice to anyone starting out in music at any level what would you give them practice yeah because people say to me oh i want to learn guitar or i want to sing or i want to be in a band or, but i can't do it no matter what age you are if you do it start it now and practice you will do it you can do it like mm-hmm. i'm not trying to be like you can do this like li- like objectively you can do it if you yeah. practice so just do it yeah if, if you do it five minutes a day an hour a day whatever just really try it and at least work. you've tried it does work it does work it does work yeah that's the thing like you see the people are like ah. Oh, I remember at college, the young, like younger students would be like, "How'd you do that?" I was like, "I've been playing bass for like seven years. That's how I did it." 
<laughs> it's not, I'm not naturally good. I've just worked at it. Mm -hmm. So practice. And then you'll get... off and kill you. Oh, my God. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Practice. People, who will else? get you if you don't play music or practice, so... Yeah, I'll get you. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, yes. Or don't smoke. That's, that's my advice. Yeah, don't smoke. That's my advice for any budding musicians. Don't smoke. <laughs> I don't do it. And look at me now. I'm not a musician. Oh my God. Yes, you are. Maybe you should smoke. I'm not going to end the podcast on, on, <laughs> on smoking. <laughs> anyway, let's end the podcast yes. there on smoking. Thank you so much for coming on. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.